Well, let's move on to these ventricular assist devices in a little bit more detail. What's the ideal VAD? We don't have it. We're not even close. But if we had to list the criteria that we think are the important aspects to make this an acceptable therapy to everyone, what are the, what are the criteria, what would they be? First, they have to be durable. You want them long-lasting. As I'm going to show you, the first-generation VADs warrant. The average uh, length of time that the HeartMate 1 device lasted was about 16 months. That's not satisfactory. The devices have to be reliable and provide adequate flow. They have to be quiet. The first generation devices were very loud. You could hear them from the doorway of the patient. This patient, not for any moment in time, was unaware that they had a VAD, and neither were any of the people that are around them. Okay, very loud. The second generation devices, very quiet. You don't know that they're going on. They have to be smaller. You want them to be small and lightweight. You want them to be immunologically inert, particularly for transplant patients. A lot of these patients get activated antibodies that make it more difficult to match a heart. They have to be resistant to infection and thrombosis. I don't know why I used a hitman for that, but. Seemed, seemed appropriate. You'd rather they not be on anticoagulation. You'd rather that they not be hooked up to an external power source and that they could be fully implantable. There is no FDA-approved device right now, VAD, that is fully implantable, but they are on the horizon, and we expect to have one on, to market trials at least within two to three years. So this is on the horizon, which I think is the biggest thing. And of course, it has to be even, easy even for this guy to use it. Watch me end up in a commercial. <laughs> and it should be cost effective and affordable. These are all important. Uh, and each of these we've, we've conquered in a variety of uh, ways. Some we still have a ways to go on. And most importantly, as far as the way I look at these things for our patients, is they have to be forgettable. You want to be able to go about your daily life as a patient and not have to be constantly reminded and constantly wear your scarlet letter A on your, on your chest that everybody knows that you've got a VAD and they know that you're an advanced heart failure. I'm going to skip through this one. Just suffice it to say that there's a whole variety of ways that VADs can be categorized and it gets confusing to people who are not very familiar. We can categorize it as to which side of the heart, whether it's an LVAD, an RVAD, or both sides. How are we using the VAD? Is it for post-cardiotomy, cardiogenic shock, bridge to recovery, bridge to transplant, bridge to replacement? Uh, where is the pump located? How long are we going to use the VAD? What is the mechanism of the pump? This I'm going to refer to because this is really important. The displacement pumps are the first generation, and the rotary pumps are the second generation. And this advance from displacement rotary was really earth-shattering in terms of a technological emergence. The power systems can be different. Almost all of them are now electrical. And some of that conversion is now moving into the electromagnetic spectrum. And finally, we have generations of device. The first generation was the HeartMate 1. Second generation, uh, the only one approved for DT right now is the HeartMate 2, which I'm going to show you. Third and fourth generations are rapidly on the horizon. The uh, HVAD is a third generation device that's approved for bridge to transplant. What makes a third generation device different from a second is it's magnetically levitated. None of the moving parts touch each other. And that's going to increase longevity incredibly. So when we talk about these bridges, you know, we, we have this travel metaphor that we talk about with VADs. And this is the way that I think is the easiest way to perceive it. If you start here on the upper right, we have a bridge to decision. Most of these patients are your cardiogenic shock patients, the ones that show up you know nothing about. You don't know what they would be a candidate for. So what we do is we put a VAD in these patients, or ECMO for that matter, to bridge them to a final decision. Devices that are used for that nowadays are ECMO, Impellas, uh, some of the Abiumed pumps, uh, the Tandem Heart. These are ones that we haven't had until recently, and many of these patients, we have to make a critical decision without much of an information base. So we call these bridge decision because we're trying to decide what to do with these patients. Some of these patients come in, they've, they haven't been awake, they were found in shock, they were uptunded. Uh, you're not going to go and put an expensive vat in them if their brain isn't functioning or if they have other 
uh, reasons that it would make them a contraindicated for a VAD. So we call these patients the bridge, to de bridge decision, and then we make a decision. Should they be destination therapy patients, bridge to recovery, or bridge to transplant? These other boxes are very interesting categories because there's some fluidity in them. We often have patients that are bridge to transplant. They may recover their heart function and we take their VAD out. Other patients, we have bridge to transplant who then are no longer candidates for transplant. Let's say they've been bridged and developed severe renal failure, have to go on dialysis. These patients are now de facto destination therapy patients. And it works the other way as well. There are patients who you bridge to transplant with a VAD, but their antibodies are so bad that de facto they become DT patients. And there are DT patients that are so sick that you would never transplant them who get to be so good that you then consider them for transplant. So there's this wonderful fluidity that makes almost categorizing them inconsequential. Your decision that you have to make is does the patient need a VAD and then you move from there and decide what you're going to do with the patient. So we talk about the generations of devices. The first generation devices are what we call the pulsatile pumps or the displacement pumps. These are the loud ones. These are ones that have a chamber and they open and close. They open, fill up with blood from the heart, and then close to eject, okay? Those are the first generation pumps. As you can imagine, a pump doing this 60 times a minute for God knows how long is gonna wear out eventually. It's mechanical parts that are brushing up against each other and they wear down. Also, these pumps require valves in the circuit and the valves break down and wear down over time. So there's a lot of wear and tear. They were great, the results were a terrific advance over medical therapy, but didn't bring us quite to where we wanted to be. The real thing that really broke through was the second generation device that is based on what we call the Archimedes screw concept. All right, and I'm gonna go into that in a moment, but it's a wonderful, wonderful, long ago design by Archimedes back over 2,000 years ago. And it provides for minimal parts that are touching, and so these devices have much more longevity, and they're much more miniaturized because you don't need a pumping chamber. And I'll show you what that means. Here's the typical HeartMate 1 VAD. Uh, here's the heart. There was a cannula that went into the left ventricle, took blood through a valve into this pumping chamber, and then ejected through another valve into the aorta. Uh, there was this drive line. So all this is inside the patient. There's a drive line that comes out of the skin somewhere in the right upper quadrant and then is attached to the controller, which is the computer unit and the batteries. Uh, this drive line also has a vent. For the initial, any of these pumps that go like this, there are air pressure changes that need to be vented and it's, it's done via this drive line too. Not gonna go over this, but there were a whole bunch of differences between first and second generation that are big advances. You know, they're quieter, they're smaller, they're simpler, less moving parts, lower energy that make it them a much better advance than the prior generation. And quite frankly, I was very surprised to see how fast they came upon the scene because it took an enormous amount of years just to get to the HeartMate 1 into clinical use. So the first generation VADs, the ones that are the pulsatile ones, limited durability, they were large, they required venting, the surgery was much more extensive. To implant this big pump in the belly required a lot more dissection. Everywhere you dissect in surgery, it can bleed afterwards, and these patients had a much higher rate of bleeding post-op. And the survival is poor. It's much better than medical therapy, but doesn't get, get us to where we think this is worthwhile therapy for everyone. And it's not forgettable. These pumps you knew about all the time. The second generation have much better durability. Their axial flow, and I'm gonna show you that mechanism in a moment, they're smaller, they don't need venting, there's less surgical dissection and better survival. And over 90% of the VADs that are put in nowadays are with these pumps. They rapidly took over. And the patient can't forget every once in a while that they have this device. It's not making noise. Uh, it's on their belt. It's lightweight. Uh, typically, they can do a lot of activities. And of course, probably every five minutes or so, they remember they have a VAD, but it's not constantly on their mind.